Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm pleased to chair also this uh, section and to introduce uh, Jörg Schumacher. He's going to speak about the turbulent convection at uh, different aspect ratios, in particular larger than, larger than one, please. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much first uh, for the invitation to this meeting. It's a very interesting meeting uh, going across the disciplines, which is always a very fruitful thing. So uh, I'm going to talk now about a class of turbulence problems that were basically not really touched in Sweeney's introductory lecture. Um, we are going to uh, involve boundary layers. And as you can imagine, in most natural flows, in particular those who are driven by buoyancy forces, and these are exactly these turbulent convection flows, they are very important. They um, <clears throat> They have a rich physics, which uh, we only poorly understand. And the reason uh, this motivates uh, the present research. And um, <clears throat> in this uh, particular case, I'm going to say a little bit about effects of compressibility. And uh, then I'm, uh, I'm going to move towards very high Rayleigh numbers. Very high means as high as we can get currently. And what that means, uh, you will uh, see in a couple of slides down the road. Um, let me start. Let me start if my computer wants to start. Yes. Let me start with a, with a prominent example of convection uh, in a natural flow. This is a satellite image movie of the sun. And in the outer 30% of the solar interior, we have turbulent convection going on at an extremely high Rayleigh number. That means the turbulence is very vigorous and at an extremely low Prandtl number. I'm going to talk about this uh, later, what these definitions exactly mean. Um, you see how convection is manifest, particularly if you look at these, uh, at these grainy regions um, at the surface, uh, close to the surface, convection becomes manifest in the form of granules. And when you listen into the sun also as in the form of supergranules. And this is a very complex physical flow. There are others like atmospheric flows, ocean flows. They are typically always coupled to other physical processes, which make, makes these problems extremely hard. Here it is magnetic field and radiation and rotation, just to give you uh, a flavor. So the idea is, um, <clears throat> can we somehow simplify the physics in these systems to a very elementary fundamental system and try to uh, advance our understanding in those kind of flows. And the simplest system which you, which you can have is just a planar layer of fluid, which is enclosed by a solid plate that is uniformly heated from below, and another solid plate at the, at the top that is uniformly cooled. And uh, the fluid in between becomes very turbulent if you have a strong temperature difference between the top and the bottom. And uh, we want to understand in which way the heat is carried across the layer and the momentum. And uh, as we will see the boundary layers, which form close to the top plate and close to the bottom plate play a crucial role in this process. I will talk about two specific cases. The first one is we are going fully compressible, non bussinesque Bussinesque means in this case that the fluid is incompressible and that the density of the fluid is a linear function of the temperature. So non bussinesque means we are violating this. Strongly. And this is the work of, uh, together with John Panikachural John, who is sitting in the audience. And uh, I will only talk briefly about this. So, any detailed questions you have, uh, please contact John. He is here and in flesh and blood, and you can talk to him. Um, and the second part is uh, we are going to the incompressible bussiness case. Uh, but we are pushing the Rayleigh numbers to very high values. And uh, the Prandtl number in both cases is, the, is, is about one. 
and the aspect ratios are large. So it's not that we are going to very confined geometries, which typically will be used or have to be used in experiments and also in past simulations. We are trying to have a large aspect ratio, as large as possible. It's always a compromise, as you can imagine, and have even periodic boundary conditions. This is a joint work together with Roshan Samuel, a postdoc in my group, Georgi Sinchenko, he is a PhD student, Mattis Bode works at the Yuli Supercomputing Center, and Katapali Srinivasan. So let's start with the first part and the questions which we had, uh, uh, which we had tried to answer here were the following one, which regimes of compressible convection exist actually? You can imagine we have a few more parameters in the flow when we solve the fully compressible system. And what we did is we classified these, uh, we classified these regimes and then we were got particularly interested in a specific regime which is characterized by a very strong stratification uh, of the uh, adiabatic equilibrium profiles. So why compressible convection? And I'm coming back to the motivating example at the beginning. Well, what you see here are the profiles of um, temperature, density, and pressure across the solar convection zone, which is indicated in yellow here. And you see that particularly and at the surface, when we cl get close to one, these quantities decrease extremely strong. So there's an extremely strong stratification uh, in the convection system, particularly close to the surface. Here, um, this is a picture, this is an optical picture of the solar granulation. In these dark uh, regions, the boundaries of the granules, the plasma dives down with the speed of sound. And it is an effect which comes due to the out going radiation. The outgoing radiation is a driver of the whole convection process. We have broad upwellings from the inside, which are the brighter regions in the center, and they are much more gentle. So there's a highly asymmetric uh, convection pattern configuration. On top of it, we have uh, temperature dependent material parameters such as conductivity and viscosity. And you can imagine that in these compressible boundary layers, we have an, a, a, a further additional new class of instabilities. So these are the equations we are solving. Mass balance, momentum balance, energy balance, together with the equation of state, the system is closed. We have the viscous stress tensor and we have the internal energy density. It's a very little box which we are talking about. So large aspect ratio in the for the rest of this talk means four. You can consider this as not large, but many people probably consider this as large. It's a matter of taste. And uh, <clears throat> we have periodic boundary conditions at the sites, and we have just uh, solid walls and prescribed temperatures at the top and bottom. So this is the configuration throughout this talk. Um, there are a few parameters. Here, this is the super adiabaticity, which basically tells you the excess of your temperature profile uh, uh, over the adiabatic equilibrium state, which you have in this uh, configuration. There's a definition of a characteristic velocity, the free fall velocity. This is the Rayleigh number. And uh, take a look at the cubic power uh, of the height with, which enters uh, the Rayleigh number definition the dimensionless measure of the thermal driving of the convection flow. This is the Prandtl number, thermal conductivity, kinematic viscosity. So it relates momentum and temperature diffusion. And we have a Mach number because there's a compressible flow. So if you look at these dimensionless parameters, you can actually uh, uh, span a parameter plane with respect to the super adiabaticity. I have defined this quantity already on the last slide. And the dissipation number D, which is a measure of the stratification. It basically relates your temperature profile to the dry adiabatic lapse rate, uh, which is G over CP. Yeah. And this, both parameters vary between zero and one and they are not fully independent of each other. That means the parameter plane is this triangular 
region which is spent for all compressible flows. At the origin of this uh, plane, you have the oberbeck businesk limit, incompressible and um, uh, linear temperature dependence uh, of the density. So if you go along this line, you increase at a fixed superadiabaticity the stratification in your convection layer. So you get uh, via the unelastic regime, uh, which is often used in atmospheric turbulence, to the uh, strongly stratified convection regime. On the other hand, if you go up the y-axis, you get to a strongly superadiabatic regime, which can be obtained for small d. Uh, and there's a region actually here in this part of the parameter plane where the Mach number becomes largest, uh, which we term as the fully compressible regime, which is a kind of blend of these two other regimes. So <clears throat> there are other parameters which come into play. The turbulent Mach number, a kind of response of the flow, relates the RMS velocity to the speed of sound. And there is the dilatational parameter. And this has its origin because we can decompose the velocity field by a Helmholtz decomposition into a dilatational and into a solenoidal part. And this is exactly the parameter that relates these two. It becomes also large if we are going to this, uh, to this regime. So the one regime which I will particularly talk about, we have also uh, looked at the others, is this one here. So we are in this corner of the parameter plane. And you see these extremely uh, deep diving uh, coherent plumes, which go deep into the, uh, into the convection layer, but you don't see it's a, a counterpart coming from the bottom. So there's a highly asymmetric uh, flow configuration, which we obtain already at very moderate Rayleigh numbers. The Rayleigh numbers are not really big, but we are working hard to get them bigger. Uh, so we are moving along this parameter plane along this line, enhance the stratification, and our mean temperature profile, which we take across the boundary layer, more and more starts to deviate from the, from the typical symmetric case, which we would have in the oberbeck business case, which would mean we have a boundary layer here, we have a well-mixed core at 0.5, and we have another boundary layer. So this is what you get when you increase the, dissi uh, the dissipation number, the stratification. And this is in, uh, uh, in connection with, uh, with an enhancement of the turbulent Mach number also asymmetrically over the uh, boundary layer. It's all for, this is all, all for compressible. This is, a, uh, this is, uh, this is not exactly the OB limit, it's somewhere here, yeah? So we are a little bit away, and that's why there's already a deviation which we see, yeah? Right? Yes, yeah. everything, because we are not, uh, none of these simulations is the real exact overback business limit. No, no, you have, there is turbulence, the, the stuff gets mixed, yeah? Um, so if you look at the uh, heat transfer, that's the quantity we are interested in. It's typically measured as a, in form of the Nusselt number. And the Nusselt number is basically composed of two, two uh, terms. The one is the, the heat that is carried by the fluid motion, that's the convective part. And the other one is the one which becomes important in the, inside the boundary layers. It's the diffusive part, because the first one has to go to zero there due to the no-slip boundary conditions. And in the Oberbeck-like or Oberbeck, exact Oberbeck case, you see that there are basically two contributions, the, the convective one and the diffusive one. And if you take their sum plane by plane across the whole layer, you get a constant uh, value. And this is exactly the Nusselt number. Things become much more complicated if we go to the strongly stratified compressible flow regime, because we have not only the convective current and the diffusive current, we also have work due to compression, and we have dissipation, frictional effects, which uh, have to be considered, which cannot be neglected anymore. 
And you see that these effects, uh, that these terms also contribute to the balance, which in total again, and this is this dashed line here, uh, sums up to a constant value. So as I said, I'm uh, going a little bit shorter over this. Um, and I'm just now saying what, what we are currently investigating here. And this is, uh, we are actually trying to understand the, the dynamics in this uh, top boundary layer uh, uh, much better. So how important is wave propagation there? Um, you see that the convective heat flux is strongly suppressed when we move towards this layer, which can be seen here by this uh, uh, vertical profile. And um, so it, it, it is a stably stratified layer out of which we are seeing these plumes which are descending coherently into the bulk. And then the question is, uh, is there a kind of self-focusing effect due to the compressibility? That would be important when you think back of the solar example, which I gave at the beginning, the, que the question which is completely unclear is how deep these plumes, which are formed due to the strong radiative cooling, actually dive down into the solar interior. And what, uh, uh, what do these uh, uh, structures, these dynamical processes, how do they contribute to the mixing, to the mixing in the bulk? Um, yeah, uh, you see that the, the heat transfer, the global heat transfer is strongly reduced when we are cranking up this uh, strong stratification in our system. Okay, good. Let me move to the second part. And the second part now is uh, uh, related to Boussines convection. So we are going to the ideal system. We have symmetric top and bottom boundary layers, and we are pushing the Rayleigh numbers as high as we can. And we do this in the configuration I mentioned at the beginning. So we are having a larger aspect ratio than one, and we have periodic boundary conditions. That means there is no sidewall, there is no constraint flow which has to form in each closed cell, which is typically taken in the experiments. And then we are asking, uh, how is this mean flow, which go, is sweeping across the plates, looking at all uh, what determines the local dynamics of in these, inside these boundary layers, and which instability mechanisms are at work. And this is a central question, as you might imagine, because it is related um, to the existence, to the possible existence, I have to say, of an ultimate uh, regime of convection. And I have taken a sketch, which is uh, from a recent Physics Today paper here. Uh, what does this imply? Well, it implies that uh, a classical heat transfer law, which is uh, Nusselt goes as the Rayleigh number to the one third, uh, uh, is somehow interrupted at some stage and crosses over into, uh, into another, the so-called ultimate regime of uh, turbulent heat transfer. And um, if this transition exists, it's unclear uh, how this transition proceeds is totally unclear. Um, and uh, uh, there, are, there are experimental results, numerical results, which say it exists. There are others which uh, say it does not exist. So it's, it's a controversially uh, uh, discussed uh, issue currently. And uh, what happens there? Well, what happens there is sketched here. So uh, a supposedly laminar boundary layer at uh, low and moderate Rayleigh numbers uh, proceeds itself uh, into a turbulent one, which is sketched here. And that in some, in some sense opens the loophole and, uh, and, makes, the, uh, and makes the heat uh, transfer much more efficient. That's the idea. So you see, uh, I have taken from, from this paper a collection of experimental results and there are very different outcomes and the Rayleigh numbers go up to 10 to 16. They can go even higher up to 10 to 17. Um, and there are different uh, experiments gathered and it's, it's really hard to say what, what, what happens. And um, it depends very sensitively on the experimental conditions as you might imagine, because all the experiments have to, have to be pushed to, the, to their limits. 
And this is a simulation which we have done a couple of years ago in a slender, in a slender convection cell. So this is the bottom plate which is heated and this is the top plate which is cooled. The flow is highly constrained, uh, but since we have this cubic dependence on the height for the Rayleigh number, we were able to advance uh, the simulations uh, all the way up to a uh, Rayleigh number of 10 to 15. And we are getting uh, a perfect uh, one third scaling. So the system does not show any, any tendency to, to, to leave this blue branch, which we see in this plot. What? No, this is a closed cell. So the flow is highly constrained, yeah? Uh, this is a closed convection cell with solid walls everywhere. Um, so here is what we are looking at. We are looking, as I already said, at the Boussines case with periodic boundary conditions. And um, the simulations which we have conducted so far um, have a range that goes from 10 to 5 uh, up to 10 to 11. And um, uh, we always made sure that the resolution in the boundary layers is, uh, is sufficient. And we also made sure that we have sufficiently long uh, averaging periods over which we can stake the statistics. That means 100 freefall times uh, for the highest Rayleigh number of 10 to 11. All this is run on a, on a, on a Jewels booster GPU cluster at the Jülich uh, supercomputing. And, Correct, and sidewalls are periodic. Uh, so here are the temperature profiles for all these data. And uh, you see the boundary layer at the top, and then you see the well-mixed region in the bulk for all cases, and you see the boundary layer at the bottom. And then you can zoom in, and this is uh, the mean temperature profile for the four highest uh, Rayleigh numbers, and we have resolved the uh, the boundary layer in the highest case with at least 11 grid points. These are the temperature fluctuation profiles, which are defined here. And typically the, uh, the uh, maximum, the local maximum of the fluctuation profile is another indicator for the thickness of the thermal boundary layer. As I said, we have uh, tried our best also to make sure that the simulations um, are well resolved, in, well resolved enough. So we have run three cases with um, higher polynomial order. This is a spectral element scheme and uh, have compared the, uh, the temperature fluctuation curves and they coincide nicely and lie on top of each other. And this is the recent run which just started. These are really data from a couple of days ago where we are now shooting for uh, 10 to 12. Uh, and that requires the whole machine uh, for this uh, simulation run. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, turbulent heat transfer as a function of Rayleigh number and the turbulent momentum transfer as a, uh, as a function of the Rayleigh number. Nusselt and Reynolds number are shown here in a compensated plot. And uh, we have gathered the data uh, that we have. The blue points are the ones which I have shown already for this very slender closed convection cell, which looks like this. And uh, the green data are older data from our group uh, where, we, where we have a uh, uh, an aspect ratio one closed cylinder. So the diameter and the height are the same. Uh, and that, that are these points and these points and the red points are the ones which we are now collecting for the most recent uh, data record. You see that the uh, that the turbulent heat transfer seems to be almost, I would say, rather insensitive to the uh, specifics of the geometry. The picture is completely different if you go to the momentum transfer. It matters a lot if you have a slender, highly constrained cell, or if you have a, if you have a closed flow at all, or if you have an open cylinder. And um, yeah. This, is, uh, this gives a different, a different uh, scaling behaviors here, but it looks like that we are here also getting into an asymptote. And I would expect that we are getting about the same scaling properties, despite the prefactor uh, is uh, significantly different. Okay, 
Um, let us take a look at the, at the boundary layer flow itself. So what I show you here is an animated streamlined plot of an instantaneous snapshot inside the thermal boundary layer. We are at half the height of the thermal boundary layer, very close to the wall. And these are our old simulations in a closed cylindrical cell. Uh, Rayleigh number is three times 10 to 10, and uh, the Prandtl number is exactly the same. And here's the large aspect ratio system. What you see if you look at this flow is you see quite a bit of a mess. So there's nothing which is really a coherent large scale flow. Uh, it's even worse. It's, uh, it's uh, that you have regions which are completely, there's no shear flow at all. Yeah. So it's, for instance, this region, and this is an aspect ratio one. This is exactly the same area which I showed here where we have a, uh, where we have a uh, relatively ordered shear flow that sweeps across the plate. So here the situation is rather different. And uh, this is exactly what we have uh, investigated now in a little bit more detail. So <clears throat> what we have tried is first to see how strong is the, uh, do these uh, patterns uh, differ? So we have basically decomposed our boundary layer velocity flow into decoherent and coherent flow uh, sections uh, by thresholding with the corresponding root mean square velocity in that plane. And then we have calculated a kind of local orientation of the, of the shear flow in this uh, local region. And we have done something which is very similar to what, uh, to what uh, Samridi yesterday did with the local multifractality analysis. We have basically boxed our whole uh, area and then we have calculated these quantities. And, and this is what you see. You see uh, there are coherent uh, shear flow patches, but they have different directions. And uh, uh, that is uh, certainly something which makes it uh, further complicated when you think of how should such a flow uh, become turbulent. If you now put together the temperature field and the velocity field and... No, there's no mean flow. If you really take a mean flow across the plane, it's or it's uh, it's very it's it's not very regular and it's a very small amplitude. It has yes yes, but you would see the same if you would have an extended closed box. But unfortunately, no one can get that far in in terms of the, yeah 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 okay. Um, <clears throat> so here. Uh, we, we go and show the temperature. Unfortunately, the resolution is very bad, so you cannot see the fine details, but I hope uh, you see a little bit. Um, there is, it's full of little thermal plumes at the beginning, and they start to cluster to form bigger structures. So there are holes which are becoming successively larger. And then if we are going into the bulk, so we are at 100 times the thermal boundary layer thickness, you basically see one prominent feature uh, of, uh, of enhanced temperature here in the middle. And if you would have a larger aspect system, you would get a large scale pattern again, which we term, uh, which we terms uh, the superstructures. There's not much happening uh, in terms of the, of the direction uh, for the shear flow. Certainly the magnitude uh, increases if you're moving further away uh, from the wall. So we went all the way down to the bottom plate. And um, there, uh, there are two quantities which you can look at, and they can be considered as a kind of blueprint uh, for what's going on in the boundary layer. This is the, this is the wall shear stress. So the wall shear stress is a two-dimensional vector field. It has critical points. Uh, and it is, it, it is formed of the two components of the velocity gradient tensor which survive at the plate. And these are the two transversal uh, uh, derivatives with respect to the horizontal velocity coordinates. And then you can start to do uh, analysis of the vector field. And you can connect it to the temperature derivative with respect to the vertical coordinate at the wall. This is a nice, a, a nice blueprint of where the plumes, the thermal plumes detach into the bulk. And we have done that. So we have basically classified our, uh, our, our wall shear stress field 
And these are the field lines of this two-dimensional vector field. And here are these uh, critical points. This is an example at a, at a very small Rayleigh number of 10 to 5. And you see there are these node, saddle, node, triplet uh, configurations. Um, so there are two impact regions locally. They shift the stuff together. And then at the saddle point, the fluid takes off. Yeah. So you can do this for, for all the Rayleigh numbers. And we have done that. So here you see, <clears throat> here you see 10 to 5, 10 to 6, 10 to 7, 10 to 8, 10 to 9, 10 to 10. And it becomes more and more of a mess. And uh, I'm afraid you don't see anything here. But uh, um, <clears throat> what you see is that uh, there are regions where there are almost no critical points. So they seem to cluster, yeah, these, uh, these critical points. And uh, there is a connection between these clustering of these critical points and the decoherent flow regions, which I mentioned at the beginning, and the high shear flow regions and the much lesser uh, density of, uh, of these critical points. And again, the, back, the, the gray background contours are the corresponding temperature derivatives. Um, but even further, you take a simulation snapshot at 10 to six, and this is what you see. A temperature derivative, wall shear stress, vector field. And then you take the same picture and 10 to 11. And what you see at the top figure is you see nothing. But um, now you can go into this, uh, into this region. So you, you, you have a very small volume. It's this little cube here and here. And, uh, and you expand it. And then you see again that the structures are very similar to, what, to that. There seems to be a kind of self-similarity uh, that means um, the, uh, the, these local building blocks becoming denser and denser. Uh, but if you go local, you, you basically recover the same phenomena which you have uh, observed for the whole plate at the, uh, at the lower Rayleigh number. So the ingredients of these fluctuating varying boundary layers are there. All the Rayleigh numbers from the smallest to the largest. So there's nothing new coming on top of it. It's just um, that they are getting, here's the time dependence. Again, we are putting ourselves into this little island and it's pretty stormy. You see, it's going all the way uh, left to right, top to bottom and so on. Uh, and the time is the same. So it's the free fall time. So we are taking the sequence in the same time units. So the question is, is there also something with respect to the time dependence? Is there, uh, is there a characteristic time scale? And um, <clears throat> that is what we, uh, what we have to analyze in the coming, uh, coming weeks and months. So uh, <clears throat> yes, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm almost finished. So let's, let's take a look into the literature. And it's probably not the literature that is uh, looked into so, so frequently. Here's an old paper by Lou Howard uh, from 1966. And if you read this pic, uh, paper, it's really nice to read uh, uh, because he, he really tries to explain all the uh, classical uh, concepts of uh, uh, thermal convection. And at the end, he comes up with a little model, and this is a, is a diffusive model. So we have a pure, purely conductive state. And then uh, he solves this model, and uh, he basically uh, studies the growth of such, a, of such a boundary layer, which is a uniform growth, because um, there is no flow involved here. And he comes up with a, with a scaling that the Nusselt number, in this case, uh, goes as really to the one third. And the prefactor is pretty much dominated by this, uh, by this Rayleigh number, which is formed with respect to the thermal boundary layer thickness, which is of the order of 1,000. So if we have a one-third scaling, it means that the heat transfer is basically independent of the height of, of the total height of the convection layer. There's another paper, which also, to my view, has not received enough attention by Jaiwant Arakeri and his uh, colleagues from the late 90s, in which he basically 
uh, also studied such a configuration uh, in the boundary layer, and they even solved the boundary layer equations numerically for such a model. You have, you have these plumes which are rising, you have a downwelling flow, and he considered a periodic chain of these plumes which, uh, with a characteristic spacing scale. Again, you're getting, uh, you're getting this uh, classical one-third scaling. We have looked at, uh, at this inspired by our, uh, by our um, node settle node triplet configuration for these critical points. It's basically very similar spirit to what uh, Arkeri and, um, and his coworkers have done uh, some more than 20 years ago. And um, <clears throat> we are currently, yes, I'm almost done. We are currently extending this. So what we have done is we have, we have really picked we have really picked these local regions, and then we have tried to, to match this analytical local model for the boundary layer dynamics to what we see from our simulation data, and it works for 10 to 5, and it also works if we are zooming in again at a higher Rayleigh number. So uh, I'm almost done. I'm just um, trying to put together uh, our current results, which is all still in progress, there's nothing which is so far settled. We are really working to working hard to, to learn more about this. The present picture, to me at least, is there is a kind of self-similarity in, in, this, in this whole boundary layer. And we have, we have basically shearless boundary layer regions and we have high shear boundary layer regions. And you can see this only clearly if you go to sufficiently large aspect ratios, otherwise, it's impossible. And on top of it is if you have a constrained flow in a closed cylinder, there is a, there's always a large scale flow, no matter how complicated it is, but there is a flow that sweeps across the plates and it will have an impact. And this flow is absent here. So in that sense, the system is much more disorganized or better to say locally organized. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, what we have to determine now is exactly this plume spacing. It's not at e as easy as in these laminar boundary layer models because we have different spacings in the, in the different uh, regions here. So it probably will boil down also to a local analysis. Then there's this question, is, it, is this whole process in, in the boundary layer dynamics somehow related to a directed percolation process? Uh, I cannot say it now, but we certainly will try to to approach this uh, problem. And uh, with this and the summarizing slide, uh, I have basically said everything I wanted to say. I'm just going to the references and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Jürgen. Room for questions, please. You showed a compilation of experimental yes. data which were departing from each yes. other and from the one third. Yes. So could some of this be explained by non boosinesque effects in each experiment and them being different from each other? Um, I can only say that much on the non boosinesque effects. Uh, we have now a joint project together with the colleagues in Brno in the Czech Republic. They have done parts of these experiments and we look into non bosinesque effects very systematically, and they are there. They, uh, uh, and they become more important, as you can imagine, when your fluid uh, is driven towards the critical point. So their working fluid is helium gas, yeah? And you have a triple point. And the closer you come to that point, the bigger the non bosinesque effects are. And uh, we have looked at this very systematically, and it's, uh, it's a recent paper together with the people from the Czech Republic. Uh, I don't want to speculate about all the other experiments, but uh, probably there, is, uh, there are non bosinesque effects because they all have to be driven uh, very hard yeah, to get to the high Rayleigh numbers. But here, uh, I want just want to make sure I understand. So, Hover has no turbulence at all. No, it's and it just gives a laminar. Sort. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, so, how it gives? So what's, uh, so well, he's just solving a diffusion problem. He's basically just solving a diffusion problem. It's, it's a growing 
lay, it's a growing, uh, so you have a wall which is heated and there's no temperature zero everywhere. And then you start, uh, it's like a first Stokes problem or second Stokes problem where you, where you basically look at the growth of such a boundary layer. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a diffusion equation which he solves. Vis a vis non business effects that uh, Rama uh, asked, um, the, the Czech uh, uh, group's conclusion seemed to be that they are there everywhere, as we discussed in helium experiments, but they are uh, much stronger in the sulfur hexafluoride than it is in helium. That is what uh, I remember them telling me. So I think they're always uh, there, especially if you have a small apparatus, you try to drive it harder and harder, and you just uh, uh, worse results in general. Uh, but I'm wondering if um, the fact that you have a periodic boundary condition will influence the large scale structure in a very significant way. And, uh, well, what it means to the, both to the flow and to the... Um, well, what should I say? I think uh, there will still be some influence of the, of the, of the size of the box. Uh, in, to, be, to be really sure, one would have to go even larger, but uh, that's simply impossible. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I, I think the effect of the sidewalls is much uh, the uh, the effect of the geometry is much smaller than in a in, in a closed in a closed container at this aspect ratio. But you can reduce and see if you have already reached a sort of thing. We can reduce, ratio. yeah. But um, <clears throat> then, I mean, the size of of the typical size of such a large scale uh, is cell is about two, yeah. yeah. And uh, so with four. Four is a compromise, yeah. yeah, no doubt about this. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Is there any numerical simulation, so where you're sure that you are Poussinesque because you imposed the equation of motion in 3D that shows the ultimate regime? No. Okay. Are there other questions? What, what do you mean? Some people may think they have. No, I don't think so. But there are, there are, I am asking because I don't know. I mean, there are published results on 3D simulations that claim to see a transition to the ultimate regime. Not as far as I so know. So most no. of them are in 2D, right? They are only in 2D. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? Yes. Does the mean wind differ with periodic boundary conditions and closed walls? Sorry, what? Does the mean wind, the large scale circulation, does the do the dynamics differ if you use periodic boundary conditions as opposed to closed solid walls? Well, if you have if you have a closed system, somehow the the, the large scale convection roads somehow have to uh, have to arrange with each other. Yeah, uh, so you need something which goes up, and you need somewhere it has to go down. Yeah, it's incompressible. So there there will be always, always the roads somehow have to to match into the box, either it's a cylinder or, or a rectangular box. And in periodic, it's uh, that degree of freedom is not there. Uh, that uh, constraint, sorry, is not So there. it does change. I would say, yes, it's a bit different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, we went on purpose for periodic boundary conditions. I just wanted, I wanted to come as close as possible, closely as possible to the original question, which was we have an infinitely extended layer in which we want to understand things and not uh, uh, a closed cylinder. Yeah. The original physical question is for a layer. Are there other questions? If not, we thank Jock again. Thank you very much. Yeah.